Hey guys, excellent to see you. Welcome to another presentation here at the Great Plains Nature Center to help you stay engaged during your isolation. Um, this is pre-recorded, but I am watching the comments while this video is up. So if you have any questions at all for me during this presentation, just let me know and I'll be answering them. Um, but my name is Rachel. I'm one of the naturalists here at the Great Plains Nature Center. And today, go figure, we're gonna be talking about bird song, and I'm so excited. So we're just gonna jump right into it. Um, and today, I hope some of you are noticing all of the jump in bird songs. There's a, a lot you can do even without leaving your house, but especially on your government mandated walk, if you are in such an area like Cedric County, um, if you're outside, you are gonna be noticing a lot of bird songs um, and some birds have been singing since like January so let's let's uh, figure out what's going on out there so I have three questions that we're gonna be tackling today during this presentation number one I want to know what is in the birdie repertoire number two I want to know how they do it and I don't just mean um, physically how because I definitely mean physically how and I think that'll make more sense once we figure out like how crazy some bird songs are, but also the know-how. Like, how, how do they know what to sing, especially on those really complex birds? So that's on there too. Um, and finally, I am curious to know what they are saying. And if you saw um, Nicole's presentation about prairie dogs, or if you listened to our podcast episode on prairie dogs, uh, on our podcast, That's My Favorite, where Nicole was just geeking out the whole time about how amazing prairie dog languages are, I think it's a really interesting question in biology right now that a lot of people are asking about animals, um, trying to analyze like what exactly are they saying and how precise can we get that? So those are my questions. Let's get started. Number one, what is in a repertoire? So um, I guess before we can really talk about that, I want to define what a song is because song has a really specific meaning when we're talking about birds. Um, so what exactly is a song? Boom. Structured vocalization used to attract a mate or defend a territory. So usually it's related to mating and it's a structured vocalization. It is to defend or impress. For example, here is a white-throated sparrow. Let's listen to his song. Beautiful. Oh, Sam Peabody Peabody. another one. I love them. Here's another variation. Surely sounds familiar to a lot of us. Okay, um, but here's the thing. Birds do a lot more than just sing. So even though this presentation is about bird song, specifically that birds are liars and girls sing too, um, let's kind of take a peek at some of the other kinds of vocalizations that birds can have. To give us an example, here's a very familiar bird, the blue jay, wait, yes. Um, and songs, sorry, sorry, sounds that are not songs, we typically refer to as calls of various sorts. So in the next 30 seconds or so of this video of this blue jay, we're going to be listening to three distinct kinds of calls that this blue jay can make. So three distinct types of calls and not an exhaustive list because birds make a lot of different sounds for a lot of different reasons. And basically if you compile every single sound a bird can make, that equals the repertoire. So all the sounds 
that a bird can make. Um, another example that I, I think has a really cool repertoire is the chickadee. Also a great example because people love chickadees and a lot of us are familiar with them. And because they're so common and they're so vocal, you can listen for these calls like right now and you can kind of figure out what's going on in the chickadee neighborhood. So this is a video um, and, and the Blue Jay video. These are both videos by Leslie the Bird Nerd on YouTube, who I quite enjoy her content. Um, and she documents a lot of the birds in her Canadian home, uh, including all the various sounds that they make. So here is a rundown of some chickadee repertoires. So this first sound you're gonna hear, the chickadee only does it one time, so I wanna explain before I play the calls. Um, or the video, it, it's gonna do its actual song. So it's the Phoebe song of the chickadee. That's him trying to impress and defend, but we'll, we'll keep going. Classic, recognizable chickadee. That is what they are named for. Um, and that seep, seep, seep call that they do, that is a really high intensity alarm call. We'll talk more about that later. Um, but then that DDD, that's an alarm call. And again, we'll dive into that a little bit more later too. But there are still other sounds that chickadees can make. For example, here's these strange gurgling calls, which are usually used in context of aggression toward or against other chickadees. So it's like specifically used to set like lower ranking chickadees in the chickadee hierarchy back in their place in the social set of things. So it's just reserved for chickadees. And sometimes they will also use it in the context of like pairs. So listen for this like weird gurgling chickadee call. So, oh. again, lots of variation. And, like, I don't know what they're saying, but I'm so curious. Um, so next time you see chickadees or you hear the DDD call, listen for those other calls in the chickadees' repertoire. I'm going to give us another example of a repertoire from um, a bird that's not a songbird and one that you may also be hearing around your neighborhood, especially if you live downtown here in Wichita. That is the barred owl. Now, it is one of the resident owls that's pretty common in Wichita, does not migrate, so it's here all year. And here are some of the calls that you might be hearing, or songs. Number one is their territorial call, which I'm sure a lot of us will recognize. <coughs> for you who cooks for you all that's their territorial call now we also have right here the uh, male and female duet which is also known as caterwauling um, it's kind of like a bonding thing for the pair it's something that they do together <laughs> crazy um so that's fun and and those calls that i've been playing and these little like um audio bubbles those are coming from the stokes audio field guide to birds um but you can get examples of all these different bird songs on allaboutbirds.org it's my favorite resource for bird songs and information that you can find online so check that out if you want to find more um but also we have here a barred owl asking for a date so let's listen to this female barred owl asking for a date <coughs> Ooh. <laughs> so that's it. But here's the thing. Um, even in familiar species like this, where maybe you recognize some of those songs, they often have unfamiliar sounds in their repertoire that maybe you don't hear in the correct context. 
maybe it sounds so different from their other calls that you don't know which bird it's coming from or even whether it's coming for a bird. So here's where we're going to cue some Animal Planet wildlife experts who are faced with an unfamiliar sound and, and have made some determinations. It's a, little, it's a little confusing sometimes, the repertoires of animals. All right, here we go. The strategy of ping-pong and calls back and forth kind of mimics what Sasquatches will do in the wild. And we found in the past on expeditions, when we mimicked that, we did these howls back and forth to each other over a long distance. That tended to get us better action faster than if it was just doing it from one point. Now, wait a second. <laughs> um, I got one more call for you right here by these wildlife experts. <laughs> so, here's the thing um, sometimes strange sounds that you hear in the woods are not the result of a mythical creature that we have no concrete evidence actually exists in the woods, but may in fact be from animals that absolutely do live in the woods. And it could be that the reason these guys occasionally get results from using these screaming Bigfoot calls in the woods is because that call is actually part of the barred owl repertoire. So I'm gonna go to the Macaulay Library here, which is a free, um, media resource library that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has. And uh, I'm gonna go to a particular call um, uh, here in the Macaulay Library. All right, let's listen. LNS catalog number 128-902. like to binge watch Bigfoot episodes because uh, that is one of the many calls that circulates through Sasquatch people um, as like a supposed Sasquatch call because they don't know what's in a full bird repertoire which honestly it's hard to pinpoint how many different sounds are in there especially to somebody who's like a novice bird watcher but I hope that the next time you hear a strange sound in the woods if you struggle or the prairie or wherever if you struggle to figure out what that sound belongs to, make sure you've exhausted all of your known wildlife species first. Cool, so birds repertoires can be a little bit strange. Um, let's go back into songs because songs can be incredibly complex. For example, here is a song sparrows song. Wow, crazy complex. And even sounds that songs that we hear all the time, like the Northern Cardinals song, for the, those of us living in Kansas anyway, um, let's listen to it. <laughs> kind of reminds me of like a laser gun, like pew, 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 pew. Um, there's actually more pitches in that song than there are on a piano keyboard. Amazing. Um, and then there's a really cool example like this the hermit thrush, um, where if you listen to this song closely, you'll notice it's actually harmonizing with itself in its own song. One more time. Isn't that crazy cool? 
Um, we also have birds that mimic here in Kansas. And so a lot of animals can make sounds in interesting ways, but, but none of them are really as complex as bird songs are. Uh, and nothing, I think, exemplifies that better than mimics. So here's a couple of others. They, they appropriate other sounds, usually bird sounds, but sometimes additional sounds that are not from birds. Um, both male and female mockingbirds, for example, will mimic. And uh, the best way to tell them apart, because they have so many different songs that they've copied from other repertoires in their own repertoire, uh, is to count how many times they repeat. So here's the brown thrasher. Does two repetitions. So two repetitions each time, brown thrasher. Mockingbird, on the other hand, will do up to like five or six repetitions of each different song that they're re repeating. Um, and then we also have gray catbirds here in Kansas, which only do one repetition of each song. So here's the mockingbird. Great. Awesome, awesome. So um, a mimic. But there are birds outside of the mimic family that also mimic sounds. For example, great-tailed grackles. I don't know how many of you have walked in parking lots and seen these beautiful birds. They're like so fun. I really enjoy watching them. I have a side note. I have strong feelings about the term trash birds because people like to call incredible animals like this trash birds just because they hang out in parking lots and eat french fries and are very common. But they're amazing. So please never call an incredible animal like a bird trash. Thank you, that's my soapbox for the day. But anyway, um, you might hear them mimicking car alarms and things like that. They are pretty good mimics. And then I think one of the best mimics that like maybe non-bird people, and by that I mean like people who don't, I don't know, get like super into birds, uh, maybe you don't realize this, but starlings are really, really good mimics. I've got a video of a starling mimicking and it's really hard to hear. I'll play it anyway. Very, very faint, um, but I did find a great clip. Sorry, I think it's gonna do it again. Um, here's a clip from uh, an audio show called Bird Note. Uh, you can find this show on birdnote.org. It's called Starling Mimicry, but I'll just play an excerpt from that for you guys right now. The distinctive scream is coming from a tree nearby, but when we scan the tree for the bulky form of a large hawk, we see only a small black bird. It tips its head back, opens its bill, and... We've been fooled. It's a starling giving voice to the hawk's cry. If, if there's any birders out there who will claim that they've never been fooled by a starling, they are liars. <laughs> um, my favorite is uh, in winter, they, uh, so, so starlings in general really like to mimic like whistly sort of bird songs and sounds uh, like the Mississippi kite. So I'm going to play Mississippi kite for you. And the thing about kites is that they don't live in Kansas during the winter. So if you hear that sound in the, in the winter, which you will, it's a starling. Those little scoundrels are out there mimicking. But mimics can also be crazy amazing. So here's a video, I apologize for the quality. It's uh, taken at a zoo, so it's in a zoological setting, um, of the lyre bird. And this bird is going to mimic the Now, do you notice it's mimicking two kookaburras chattering at the same time? Isn't that crazy cool? Here's another clip from BBC because I love David Attenborough. Um, also, as a side note, this bird did live in a zoological setting as well and learned these songs by living around human environments. Um, so David Attenborough is a little bit of a liar in this clip. But at the same time, this bird can still make these incredible sounds. So listen to this. 
and now the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby. Crazy. So that bird did learn it from uh, exhibit construction noises. How does that happen? Which brings me to my next question, which is how on earth do birds make all of these varied sounds? And there is a simple answer. Um, the answer is that most birds have a syrinx, which is a special voice box. So let me see if I can get doo -doo -doo -doo, a little laser pointer here. I don't know if this is going to work on my streaming thing, but we'll see. So as you can see up here where the uh, trachea of the bird branches off to go into the lungs, that's where the syrinx sits. And in humans and a lot of other animals, there is a larynx, which is our voice box. So with birds, they actually have a double voice box, which is independently controlled on each side so that they can produce a range of sounds two different sounds at the same time and very complicated like trills and and other like percussive sounds so um, i actually have a really good learning example by cornell lab of ornithology for us to look at about how birds sing um, they do have between eight zero i guess and eight different muscles that control the syrinx. So it's a pretty complex system. And this is a really great um, resource. It's free on allaboutbirds.org. It's the Academy, Bird Academy. Um, so if you're finding yourself with extra time and you want to learn more about birds and like their songs and stuff, you can visit these resources and check it out. It's pretty cool. But anyway, we're gonna play this for you. That's the Cardinal. Um, we're gonna go and play that at a quarter of the speed now. So you see how that bird is able to use both sides of the syrinx to kind of seamlessly play like this huge scale? Amazing. Um, <clears throat> now, not all birds have a syrinx, so a syrinx isn't always required to make sounds. A great example of that is the black vulture, which does not have a syrinx. Um, so like some dinosaurs, uh, birds like vultures can really only grunt and hiss and make those kinds of sounds. I do quite enjoy imagining, you, you know, when people are trying to describe dinosaur vocalizations, um, at least for the ones that didn't have like chambered hollows that could make bellows and things like that. They often compare it to a crocodile uh, or an alligator and their gurgles and hisses, but like we have a bird that does that. So I like to imagine dinosaurs when I think of the black vulture. <laughs> It just makes me smile. <laughs> Scary stuff. Um, but also importantly to note, uh, not all bird sounds actually come from their voice. Uh, I've got a couple of examples for you here. The first one is a morning dove. You may have heard this sound before. That sound of those doves flying around, that's actually their wings. Their feathers make that whistling noise as they fly. So sometimes it's their feathers. And a lot of birds actually use that in displays, whether they're threat displays or mating displays. Um, here's a common night hawk. So did you hear that? It did a little dive bomb and it made a vocalization at the same time that it made a sound with the edges of its wings. So it kind of went beep and that was its vocalization. Um, but listen, listen again, listen for the sound, that's their feathers making that noise. <coughs> Pretty cool. But then there's the other side of things, which I think is interesting, which is how do birds know what to say? For some birds, the answer is quite simple. The music is just inside of them. Many birds just instinctually know their sounds, whether it is a 
song or some kind of territorial display or threat display. Um, examples of that include things like doves. So here's a morning dove. Yes, so that is not an owl, that is a morning dove, and they just instinctively know how to make that sound. Same thing with owls and ducks and things like that. So here's our barred owl friends again. You've already heard their songs. They just know what to do. But uh, evolution isn't always fair. And uh, there are some weird branches with how these birds have developed the ability to instinctively know, which I guess is a basal trait, right? And then branches where they actually end up learning their sounds. Here's a kind of a phylogenetic tree. Um, so songbirds, including many perching birds like blackbirds, they do have some instinct involved, like their calls. So if they're making alarm calls, they don't need to learn that. But a lot of them have to learn their songs, or maybe they even have some kind of plasticity in their brains in order to learn. So that means just like plasticity means like stretchiness basically like they can adapt a little bit better uh, to learn new sounds that they make so for example over here we have some very different um, things here with like hummingbirds they have a vocal pathway embedded in their audio pathway auditory pathway um, which means they are actually learning songs in the same way that songbirds are um, whereas parrots are often, uh, let's see, it's, it's separated from the auditory pathway. So that means um, they're not having to listen for songs in order to learn them. They just instinctively know it. So there's a couple of different branches here. So it can make it a little bit confusing. But for the most part, apart from things like hummingbirds, which are weird, um, most birds that know... Or, or that learn their songs are actually these like passerine songbirds. So here's a bit of a better picture, I guess, of what that looks like. Um, we have other birds like the barred owl, owls and, and things like that. Uh, but then perching birds, which is the order Passeriformes, those guys learn their songs. And we divide them into two different groups. We've got sub ossine passerines and ossine passerines, like those cardinals. And I've got a great visual that we can use to kind of compare that. It was uh, illustrated by Sarah Mienka um, for the UIC Biomedical Visualization Program. And basically what you're looking at here is on the left, we've got an ossine uh, oriole, for example, syrinx compared with a sub ossine bird. So true songbirds, the ossine songbirds, they sing complex songs, and they have a huge array of musculature around their syrinx to develop those extra complex songs that they're learning. So passerines learn their songs. The ossine true songbirds are the ones that are incredibly complex, and that's pretty stinking cool. Um, so here's our true songbirds. Uh, they make up actually about half of the world's birds, so that means about half of the world, word, 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 words, sorry, about half of the world's birds have to learn their songs, complex songs at that. And learning actually begins in the nest, it turns out. So not only are they learning the notes, but the University of Washington discovered that juvenile song sparrows are actually more interested in listening to two different adult male song sparrows sing at each other than they are at just listening to one song. So what we learn from studies like that by the University of Washington is that when young birds in the nest are listening to sounds like this, they're not just listening for a single male. They're not just listening for a father figure or the nearest bird. What they're actually hearing and listening for is the interactions, the communication that's going on, and the winning strategies among the entire neighborhood's vocal battle that's taking place. So that's pretty cool. So they spend that period of time in the nest learning, and then when they fledge and they leave the nest, it's time to practice. 
Um, and again, I have a really, really amazing um, set of tools by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology for us to learn about this. This is the Bird Academy um, Practice Perfect is the name of this exercise. Uh, it's about bird song. And we're going to like listen to how these birds practice. So I love, they compare it to kind of, um, you know, when human babies are first learning speech. They don't start out by saying full sentences and just having perfect grammar. What do they do? They babble their sounds. And so that's what you see with young birds as well. Um, to illustrate that, we're gonna listen to the song sparrow, whose song we already heard, um, but we'll listen to both the young bird learning its song and the adult bird that kind of has that like perfect or crystallized song. So that's the baby. Um, now we're going to listen to the adult. An amazing difference, right? Let's go back again and listen to that adult song. Okay, now the practice. Do you hear how that's like baby babbling, basically. Um, we've got another example here for you, which I love. Um, again, we've already listened to the white-throated sparrow sing. That's the one that was like, hold sand, Peabody, Peabody. So let's listen to this young bird practicing his song. I'm so wavy and like imperfect. Okay, adult. Clear, confident, precise. Here's the practice. Isn't that so sweet? Now what's really cool is that um, the second I realized that young birds learn to sing, when I was going out during the winter um, or even in the early spring, you can actually hear these birds practicing. You'll hear cardinals that are often in the um, cedars or something doing these like imperfect wavy babbly sort of song is just practicing all winter trying to get it perfect and oh, it's just so cool so please listen for that um, if you don't hear it this spring it might be a little late now listen for it in the fall when those little birds are like spreading out and just starting to be adults but here's where things get kind of tricky um, we are still trying to figure out how much of this is learned and how much of it might be instinct. So this is a bird called the brown-headed cowbird, which is one of my favorite birds. Um, and what makes this bird kind of a unique thing, um, learning experience, I guess, is that this is a songbird. It's a blackbird, which is a type of songbird. That's its song, that like water droplet sound. Let's do it one more time. Yep. They are obligate parasites which means they do not, sorry, nest parasites, I should specify. Um, they do not build their own nests. They exclusively parasitize other bird nests by laying their eggs in other birds' nests. So for example, here's our friend, the hermit thrush, stuck raising a cowbird chick. <laughs> That's not its own baby, along with its own babies. But here's what the hermit thrush sounds like. which is completely different from a cowbird. So if a cowbird is being raised separately from its own species, but it can still sing its own song, um, that posed an interesting question for researchers trying to figure out like how are birds learning these things? And there is some evidence that suggests, especially in this case, that there might be some kind of instinctual template that helps birds filter out what their own species song is. So that would be kind of like if you grew up in a country where you had equally different languages being spoken around you, but maybe you were born with the instinct to pick out your language that your parents had. Um, that would be, I think, a good comparison to what these birds were hypothesizing might be able to do. Pretty cool. Um, so then the other side of that, 
uh, or I guess like, wow, sorry, the, the last question that I had to continue this conversation is when these birds are saying things, what exactly are they saying? Which I guess is my way of saying, why exactly are they making all of these different sounds? Now, um, we already do kind of know the answer to some of these questions, so I'll review a few of those things. We know, for example, what songs are for. It's males advertising. So anytime we're hearing a bird singing, we can assume that they're either trying to attract a partner or they are showing off. Uh, birds that spend time advertising with song are proving that they are healthy and there's you know um, the dawn chorus when birds are out singing early in the morning there's several different hypotheses about why they might be doing that in the morning maybe it's them showing like look I'm so good at surviving that I can spend the first hours of morning singing instead of feeding or maybe it's that the the morning air has the crispest crispest clearest sound quality um, and clarity might be a good thing to help the females tell subtle differences in their songs apart. Um, so that's something that they might be doing. The other side of things is that sometimes they are actually securing territory. A good example of that is our what red-winged blackbird. Again, this is what their song sounds like. So actually in red-winged blackbirds, the males are singing to defend their territories from other males. Um, females will mate with them and build nests within that territory. Sometimes if it's a really good territory uh, that he's secured, there will be multiple females that set up shop in his territory and go under his protection and have his chicks. But they're singing for the other males. What they're doing is a vocal battle. Uh, so the sound has a very different function for this species than, say, a song sparrow. Um, and it turns out when the females are looking for a place to go or a mate to select, they're not just looking at his territory, but also sometimes the patches of red on his shoulders um, to differentiate his quality. But here's something really cool. Girls sing too. Male birds are not the only birds that sing. A great example of that is the Baltimore Oriole. It's pretty well documented in that species that the male and the female will actually sing duets together as a way to strengthen their bond. So you will often hear duetting males and females both singing around each other. A lot of birds, we're realizing now, have female song. And this stuff makes me so excited because it's revealing these like old biases we've had where we've just made assumptions by seeing things that are a little bit more obvious and then assuming that's just the way it is without really looking deeper into it. But now we know here's a whew, crazy phylogenetic tree of birds. Um, basically what we're looking at in the circle, it's, it's like a tree of all the different groups of birds out there. The red, are ones where female song is present and the blue is where it's absent. So historically bird song has been considered an almost exclusively male trait and female song in the past, because it has been documented before, um, was dismissed as rare, atypical, or the outcome of hormonal aberrations. But it turns out not only is it incredibly normal, um, but it's probably the base trait of birds. So in 2014, Karen Odom and uh, researchers from um, her team showed that female song occurs in over two thirds of surveyed songbird species and family. Two thirds of them have female bird song. Um, this study did omit a lot of groups of North American bird species, but did determine that the ancestors of songbirds definitely had female song. Um, so this Brewer's blackbird here has female song. Um, another quote here from Karen Odom says, we show that female song occurs, oh wait, is that the same quote? Yes, it is. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, the red-winged blackbird, I guess that's my point, is that these are different blackbird species. So in, in uh, for example, the brewer's blackbird, um, they do have female song present, but the red-winged blackbird 
does not have female song. Um, and what's really interesting is that they found a correlation with the loss of female bird song in certain groups. It correlates with the loss of monogamy. It correlates with migration and several other factors. So this is a good example of that, where red-winged blackbirds are not monogamous species. There can be multiple females that are getting together with the same male. They don't have exclusive partners. And so very interesting correlations there um, with the loss of female bird song, because that's really what we should be thinking of it as, because the base trait of birds is that the females also sing. Um, including some birds that are pretty well known to us. Now, I do have, um, there's an entire website you can go to called femalebirdsong.org where they have sort of a citizen science project looking to document female bird song, and they're specifically targeting um, species of interest to look for their songs. So they, they have some great resources like these particular examples of female bird song. So in this video we're going to watch. Um, the red is the female and the blue is the male. So let's listen. <laughs> Isn't that so cool? That's a black-bellied wren, I believe. Um, and that bird has a little duet <laughs> that they sing together where they kind of circle in and out of each other. It's really, really cool. Um, here's a bird you will recognize though. This is a female cardinal. Now remember, the male cardinals, they, they do um, several different variations on their song, but typically it's like a wee, wee, pew, 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 pew sort of thing. Listen to this female cardinal singing. <laughs> spread female bird song is. Um, this whole video is on YouTube if you search for uh, female cardinals singing. Um, here's just a selection of North American birds that I believe you will recognize where female bird song is present. Um, and as far as we can tell so far, female song is usually for communicating with their partner, but a lot more research is needed, why, which is why there are projects like female bird song, which are trying to delve more into this. Um, quality that they have. Now, again, in terms of other contexts, the contexts do matter. So I don't think I'm going to play these again for you, but just remember there's all these different contexts um, in animals like barred owls, for example, uh, where they can have different purposes. If you're interested in listening for owl songs, you can play territorial songs in order to get them to respond. But here's what I will say. There is a certain ethical adherence that I would recommend um, because when you're playing like a territorial song to get a bird out, what you're doing is you're giving that bird artificial competition. And if your Bluetooth speaker or your phone or whatever is louder and more persistent than a real bird would be, you might accidentally disrupt what's happening in this bird's actual territory. And that's not at all what any of us want, especially in a backyard. So if you are interested in going owling or getting a response from birds, I would recommend not doing it at the same time over and over again. Um, and I would say do not play a call for longer than one to two minutes is typically recommended because you don't want to drive any birds away from their actual territory. So be very, very conservative. If you hear birds already calling, don't interrupt that. Just let it happen. Um, but it can be a really fun activity to go out at night. Um, maybe you can even stay in your car, practice some good social distancing and roll your windows down by a wooded area and just like turn your car off and for one minute or so, like sit, maybe sit in your car for like five minutes to let everything quiet down and then play a song out of your window for like a, an owl's territorial call for like one minute and then stop and listen. And you'll often see owls flying up to you to investigate before they even call back. And right now, before the leaves are really back in the trees, is a great time to look for them. Um, so that's a really fun activity to do. But there's other 
animals that have different contexts. Um, here's a couple, and I'm sitting in the lobby here at the Nature Center, so we may actually get our actual American kestrel over here riled up by these sounds. If you hear echoes, that's probably why. Um, but first, we're going to listen to this kestrel's alarm call. So here's its alarm call. Yeah, sure enough, okay, there goes the actual kestrel. He's a very good listener, and right now he's alert at the front of his cage with his tail whipping up and down, like, hey, I've heard your alert, I've heard your alert, what's going on? Um, but the other sound you're going to hear, which is kind of a whining sort of sound, that's a courtship song. So let's play that call again, and then we'll listen to the courtship song. So that really puts... I got them all worked up. I'm so sorry. I'm going to stop playing Kestrel Calls now. Um, but that kind of annoying little whining sound that they made that's like wavering, that's a, a courtship sound. And they also have a special sound that goes like burr, burr, that they will do um, with their mate and their chicks and things like that. Um, also, another context for different sounds that birds make is alarms and Okay, I know it's not like different because we've talked about alarm calls already, but like bear with me. Okay, so here's a fun project. Um, a team led by Eric Green um, produced this study where they were looking at alarm calls and different bird reactions to other birds. So they employed what they called robo raptors, which the term is a great term, like 10 out of 10. It's amazing. I love it so much. <laughs> Robo raptors, which are taxidermied birds of prey that have mechanical parts ingrained into them so that they can um, have these robotic moving parts to make them a little bit more lifelike. And the goal is to learn how birds communicate with alarm calls when predators are nearby. So here's a bird by um, the Cornell Lab, a multimedia team. It's uh, Chris Foido did this video. Let's listen. It's like a minute or two. <laughs> to titmouse there. Look how close that What we're finding is. is that there's this really, really complex interrelated network of many, many species all listening in and sharing information about danger. The function of this intense mobbing response with lots of birds coming in is to harass the predator and its cover would be busted and it would be driven out of the area. If you think about it, it's really hard to be a hawk because you're flying around and trying to find your dinner and yet there's this, this bow wave of information that can go way faster than you can fly in some cases. Isn't that cool? Okay, um, if this is kind of reminding you, uh, again, of Nicole Brown's prairie dog information, that's because some of it is very similar. And what's cool about uh, using predator-prey interactions and, and calls associated with predators in distress is that it's really, really easy to kind of crack the code of what they're talking about because you've got a stimulus, it's a bird, you see them um, interacting and behaving in a certain way, and you hear them calling in a certain way. And so you can also take those calls outside of the context of there actually being a threat, you can play them back and you can find out whether these birds are behaving the same way, even if they can't see a threat. And that can tell us that they're actually communicating different things about predation risks and, and things like that. And that turns out to be the case. Now, chickadees in particular are amazing. Um, if you're interested in learning more about birds and how they do it, um, there is a article by allaboutbirds.org, Cornell Lab, where they talk about the study, um, Backyard Bird Alarm Call Network is what they call it, but um, chickadees in particular are not only incredible at alerting other chickadees, but it turns out other birds like nuthatches listen to chickadees and know exactly what each of their sounds mean. So remember that like high-pitched call that we learned about before? Um, 
they tend to use that more when there's a raptor in flight. I think I originally described it as being a high intensity alarm call. That's because maybe there's a raptor that's flying in and it turns out that that higher pitched sound is harder to pinpoint exactly where it's coming from. So it's a bit safer to give out that alarm call because you're not necessarily giving away your location as easily. Um, and it's a little bit quieter, but it still spreads through the forest or the woodland, the edge or whatever, very rapidly. And um, when birds hear that sound, whether they're a chickadee, a nuthatch, or another uh, species, they know that it means take cover because there is a, an immediate threat happening. Um, so that's pretty cool. And there was a paper like all the way back in 2005 that first cracked the chickadee DDD call <laughs> and discovered that the number of Ds does have a direct correspondence to the threat level of a predator. Um, and they found out that smaller raptors, in particular things like pygmy owls that do specifically prey on birds, uh, they are, according to chickadees, the biggest threat. And so you're more likely to hear really high intensity alarm calls and mobbing for something like a screech owl than you would for a great horned owl, um, which I guess makes sense because if I'm a tiny little chickadee, I'm going to find a bird that's more my size, much more threatening than something that's so huge it might go after a skunk or a house cat instead of me. Um, not that great horned owls aren't a threat to smaller birds, but it does make a lot of sense, you know what I mean? So that's pretty cool. Um, the next time you hear chickadees going, count the Ds, if they are real ticked off, you might hear up to 12 Ds in a call. And again, family does matter. So one of my like top five like bird sounds has to be the barn owl, just because it sounds like a paranormal like banshee shriek. Um, but we're gonna listen quickly to their territorial call. Here it is, boom. Amazing, I love it. Just a horrifying shriek. But when they're at the nest, um, they record sounds like this. So they have specific <laughs> calls they will use to communicate with their family, with their chicks. Um, and for some babies, like penguins and flamingos, the baby's first cries are actually unique. So the opposite can be true as well, um, where the mother will end up recognizing her individual baby because of the unique sounds that their baby produces. A good local example of that um, is mothers signaling danger to their chicks and communicating with their chicks. Here's some little kestrels. One of them is a fledgling and one of them is an adult. Look, she's feeding the baby. Aww. Do you hear that begging call? When our first kestrel, uh, sorry, when our kestrel first came to live with us, he was still quite young and he would beg for food. You hear that really subtle, like, <laughs> So cute. It's very soft, sorry, I thought this clip was a little bit louder. But they have these unique calls. Um, but again, also, you can have, oh, I got my, my notes mixed up on these two slides. So that was young begging calls by chicks and juveniles. And the turkey is the um, threat call. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. They're not really signaling danger. Anyway, that's what I get for blindly reading my notes. Um, so here, here's a turkey hen. And you're going to notice that they're all foraging, but she will give an alarm call and watch the chicks respond. Just going about their business. Hi. Oh, and there's one of the no. dads. <laughs> That's pretty fun. Sneaking around behind me. Gosh, they're cool. Oh, mom notices something. She's going to give an alarm call to her chicks. Now watch. Oh. They all just immediately duck into cover and lay low. It's a danger sound. What'd you see? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I love the narration. It's dangerous. Oh, Mom, it. what'd you see? Yeah, me see too. Um, but yeah, that's really cool. And different see it. young will have different responses. Um, for example, with some 
young that are precocial like that where they're not in a nest and so they're out running around ducklings chicks things like that um they will hide underneath mother some of them just like immediately drop to the ground and lay low and let their camouflage do the trick like turns and things like that another really cool example of young bonding is the superb fairy wren because in this species they are pretty subject this is not a local species obviously but um they are subject to parasitization parasitization um, brood parasitization, kind of like the cowbirds. In this case, it's a cuckoo that might be parasitizing. Um, so in order for superb fairy wrens to stop other larger birds that will hog a lot of resources from invading their nest is by teaching their chicks, while they're still in the egg, a secret song, like a key. And then when the chicks hatch, if their chicks don't know the secret song, they kick them out of the nest because superb fairy wren chicks always know the song and cuckoos do not. So they will find the imposters that way and kick them out of the nest. Now, another interesting tidbit about what birds are saying, and I know that I'm going long because of course I am. I don't even have people asking me questions live in my recording, but I'm still managing to go long, um, is that birds can be liars, which is kind of fun. So there was a project done um, at WSU out at Nineska, uh Field Station where they had a couple of two, sorry, where they had two um, s winter sparrows that have a very similar natural history. Um, the dark-eyed junco on the left and the American tree sparrow on the right. And what was interesting was that um, the juncos tend to be a little bit fatter. They have bigger fat deposits on their body. And uh, this particular researcher, she hypothesized that communication could be a part of it. So juncos produce a lot of calls. They identified five different call types, including one specifically for alarms and ground predators, and one to ward off arrival. So here is a junco altercation filmed at a feeding station. here is that they have specific calls for dealing with each other versus dealing with predators. Now on the other hand we have things like tree sparrows where there's really only one alarm type uh, that was used, one, one call that was used to sound an alarm. Um, and tree sparrows will use that particular alarm call with or without actual danger. So they'll use it both in altercations with each other and when there's actual danger. As these guys are feeding, somebody sounds an alarm, and uh, they all kind of dip out of there. So, what this study was um, hypothesizing or describing was that perhaps one of the problems with the American tree sparrow having less fat content was that these guys are kind of liars. <laughs> Which means um, when they're trying to ward off rivals that are around them, they'll just sound the alarm indiscriminately which causes them all to act as though there's a predator because it's it's one of those like um, boy who cried wolf situations where it's like, is this particular alarm about danger or is this particular alarm just Fred being a jerk? And for tree sparrows, they're having to spend a lot of time and energy trying to make that distinction with each other, which is taking away potentially um, their ability to uh, cooperatively find food together. So the pr behavior of producing false alarm calls during times of food scarcity has actually been documented for several small-bodied wintering bird species, where they're just trying to trick each other into leaving the feeding grounds so that they have more access to those limited resources. But then the juncos, where they are not liars and they do have specific calls in dealing with personal inter, inter, interactions, <laughs> words, um, they're able to forge a bit more efficiently and cooperatively and therefore they are a little bit fatter and perhaps a little bit happier. Um, by the way, female juncos sing too. Now, I think this is my last point for my entire presentation here. Um, but the very last question that I have for what birds are saying is whether we can say birds have a true language. 
Because I think that's the most interesting question that researchers can ask in terms of animal communication. It is a question that has been attempted to be answered in those black-tailed prairie dogs and many other species. And this is a really hard question to answer. Um, again, what we tend to describe as a language is when information is being conveyed specifically through songs with the absence of other cues, um, or sorry, sounds, not songs. So Rosetta Stones are a good way to try and answer questions like this, but it's so hard to even describe what we're trying to look for. So here's a quote from a researcher named Dr. David Wheatcroft from Uppsala University. And he says that syntax is not unique to human language but also evolved independently in birds. So we don't necessarily know whether language is a thing that we can attribute to birds at this time, but birds have been demonstrated to string their calls together in ways that do form new meanings, which on its own is demonstrating some kind of grammatical understanding and usage, which indicates that there is syntax that birds can produce that is like a language, which on its own is honestly pretty incredible. And many birds, including things like white-crowned sparrows, have been documented to have really distinct localized dialects. Um, and in some cases, the dialects stretch so far out, if that species becomes separated, um, those different dialects can become so independent that a new species can form where they only recognize the songs of those different um, groups that are their regional, you know, comrades. We do know that, um, for example, regional accents in Alaska are very distinct. Um, I have done field work both in Kansas and Alaska, and so this is the only reason why this is a an example that I know in particular, because even though there were the same species in Alaska that I knew here in Kansas, because birds, you know, their migrations take them as far up as Alaska. Um, when I was employed by the U.S. Geological Survey up there, I was given a regional CD and asked to relearn all of the bird songs that I already knew because the Alaskan dialects were so distinctive. So the fox sparrows up there were very different from the so fox sparrow songs that I had studied in the lower 48 for my undergrad degree. Um, so that's very interesting. Uh, another species we definitely know has dialects is the barred owl. And that's really interesting to me because this bird, and we're gonna just watch him sing. Um, that who cooks for you sound is technically considered a song, but they're not a songbird. But again, it's that territorial uh, mate attraction function that matters. So this bird does not learn that song. It instinctually knows it. And yet it has been demonstrated. Wait. Oh, interesting. Well, I apologize. Let me retract that statement. Um, it has been said falsely in the past that barred owls might have regional dialects. Um, but the more that we've actually studied this, the more we've realized that maybe they don't have regional dialects and maybe we were just misdescribing it. Um, and maybe that's because it's an instinctive song, um, which I think is another interesting piece of this. So yeah, I did have to change the text on this particular slide because we have had better information come out about what these dialectual functions are. And I think there's still people out there who are saying that um, barred owl songs may indeed have dialects. Um, it's just hard to say. And I, I think um, it's hard to describe where that difference can be. <laughs> um, we know that prairie dogs definitely have dialects within each language that the different species might speak. So yeah, trying, trying to attribute something as human as language to animals is incredibly difficult. Um, but we can recognize patterns in the way that these animals are using sounds to communicate, the way that they're stringing together different sounds to form new meanings, and whether they're using the same exact sounds in the same contexts to give the same information each time, which 
is pretty cool. I don't know. Anyway, there's a lot of questions still being asked about this, and that makes it a really, really fun conversation for me and a really fun topic, and it just makes animals like that much more cool. And I, I feel like the more questions that I end up having, the more I want to keep learning about it. So I don't have anything else for you guys. <laughs> That's it for today. Um, thanks so much for listening to my presentation. If you managed to make it the whopping hour that we've been here. Um, we'll be back again tomorrow. Lindsay is going to be talking tomorrow about mushrooms. And I think she's going to do her presentation live tomorrow around noon. So that'll be pretty exciting. Tune in then. If you want to learn about mushrooms, like always, we'll have these up for a whole week. And we got our 15 minute video limit on YouTube extended. So we will be posting these lectures on YouTube as well for you to see me so maybe a little bit easier for you to find and search for too later on in the future so that's it but thanks for spending some of your isolation time with me again if you have any questions for me type them in the comments um i have links to the papers and stuff that i was talking about so i can just shoot you links to those things too if you want the references um, and more information but that's it so i guess i'm gonna peace out and uh, go set up for nature journaling which i'm doing right after this recording so see you guys later <laughs>